Hello, everybody, and welcome to Pathways in Improvisation uh, at Middlesex University. Thank you to Ben Dwyer for the invitation and to Victoria uh, for all the help and Margaret for uh, facilitating me being in the room with you today. Uh, so what I would like to talk about is improvisation as embodied knowledge. And this comes from a, a kind of long-term project, I guess I've been working on, um, called Music as Translative Epistemology, or MATE. And I know some people in the room have seen some of this before, so feel free to sing along with the ones you know. Um, what does music as translative epistemology mean? For me, it's the investigation or a coming to know through music. And What's really important to define here, and I think especially in the context that we're in as part of this conference, um, is what is to know through music? Um, and what I'm really trying to get at with this is something that I think is a little different to the way that music is usually situated. I'm not really talking about music as entertainment or even music as a cultural artifact or even music as communication. What I'm really talking about is, can you know something in music in the way that you know something in words, the way that you know something through seeing it with your eyes? And you know, they say a picture is worth a, thou a thousand words, but maybe the performance of music is worth a thousand pictures. And I think, very strongly, actually, that this way that I'm talking about of using music to understand the world that we live in is really fucking important. And I would go so far as to say that it's the difference between conceiving of music as kind of, you know, something that's nice to listen to and knowing the world through music um, is the difference between using language to read a book uh, maybe a pulp fiction paranormal romance story or using language to read the instruction manual on your parachute as your plane is about to crash into the ground. I just thought of that just now. <laughs> and I think that's quite good, actually. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. That it's, music is music, sure, but there's different ways of knowing through music, perceiving music, being in music, and some of them are more important than others. Let's be honest about it. Paranormal romance is a really important genre. <laughs> you know, there is such a thing as genre in that instance. Um, but it's not as important as knowing how to read the instruction manual in the parachute. And that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about improvis improvisation as embodied knowledge. End intro. So where did this come from? Um, it begins with water, slide of water. It moves from there to bird flocking, and then we go to forest ecology, we go briefly to astrophysics, space and quantum physics, and then we end with DNA. Um, but really, it starts with this sound. Does anybody know what that sound is? <laughs> it's our toilet. <laughs> um, we used to live in a, a really big house in Dunleary um, in Dublin, on the south side of the city, in a house from about 1830. And our toilet was enormous. We had a lot of really amazing parties in that house. It was like maybe 40 musicians lived in it over the course of the seven years that we were there. And our bathroom was like maybe a quarter of the size of this room. So we could fit 40 people and a string quartet in the bathroom. And we regularly did. Um, and it had this super old school Victorian cistern toilet, which basically just works from gravity, where you pull the thing and it goes 
uh, and then you have maybe about seven minutes and 28 seconds of white noise followed by this and you know it's a house of musicians so and the room is super resonant so every time you go to the toilet you're like <laughs> <laughs> you know and what was so amazing about it was that there's something innately musical in that sound you know it's not just a dripping sound it's got pitch it's got rhythm you know and we really wanted to understand like why is it music now what makes it musical why is that more musical than another one and this was the rabbit hole <laughs> that you know led to me talking to you today um it you know in a certain sense it meant opening up the system and putting microphones and videoing everything and slowing it down and looking at the drip pattern and flowing and studying vortex structures and so on but in another way it was really that actually music is what happens when you listen to something music actually is the listening because if you know prior to that i had always thought about music as being something you make right we're musicians we make music music is what happens when you go to hear music <laughs> you put on the, the music maker machine music comes out you know it was a very anthropocentric idea i had what i realized from water was that music is in the world and when we hear it as music that act of listening is in itself the creation of music so that was a real kind of wormhole um, and at the time that I made that recording I was actually arranging Don Giovanni for octet and electronics and, and all the singers and so on and there's about 50 movements in Don Giovanni and almost all of them end dum 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 bom pa pom which is when, he, when I transcribed the drip pattern it's exactly how it finishes so it's like this is actually basically Mozart, you know, more or less. Mozart was actually a toilet. That <laughs> is the highlight from this talk. <laughs> I can write that down. Mozart was a so this was the beginning of a project, a, a, a band, should we say, called The Water Project, uh, which is with Olesa Zdorovetska and Keith Lindsay. Uh, and then we collaborated with countless um, other artists from other disciplines. Um, and essentially what we were trying to do was to recreate that toilet <laughs> in a live situation, uh, which it turns out is actually incredibly difficult to do because there was really something about that toilet um, that was just really on the money. Um, and we performed all over the world, literally, and we never got anything that was as good as that. <laughs> but we really tried very hard. Um, and we also started to really study water. Um, this is an amazing book uh, called Sensitive Chaos that was recommended um, to us by the sculptor Helen O'Connell um, by Theodore Schwenk, uh, who founded the Institute for Flow Sciences uh, in Herreschreid in the Black Forest. Um, and this is an, a research institute founded in the 50s, which has been studying flow patterns in water for 70 years. It's now run by his son. Um, and Schwenk has some incredible insights uh, into the vortex structure. He, he was the first to really notice that when you look at a river and you see the vortexes in it, that they're occurring in chains. It's actually a vorticy chain that you see uh, in the flow pattern. And he created these amazing experiments that demonstrate and study the exact flow pattern in water and in different types of water. Um, using the Black Forest as the control stream because they have very high water purity there. Um, I can tell you lots of really crazy fucking stories about that place, but I won't uh, because I only have uh, 45 minutes left. So one thing that I was kind of wondering uh, at that time, and you know, I'll show you a little bit of what the water project was like in action in a moment, um, but essentially we were using water, aquariums, hydrophones, field recordings, uh, various ways of interacting with water in its various states um, and trying to get away from this kind of anthropocentric activity because one of the problems with playing gigs with water is that in a live situation if you go with an aquarium you put it on stage it doesn't do anything and maybe it's very similar to the electronic setup you know that Jonathan had there it only responds to an input from a person but in a, a stream or a waterfall, you know, within uh, a complete holistic ecosystem, water is alive. It's movement. It has movement. It has energy, and that energy has kinetic and sonic properties. So one of the difficulties that we faced was that when you go into a gig with an aquarium, 
you have to go like, psh, psh, psh. <laughs> you know, you have to do something or pour something. So we try and create these kind of structures that have, you know, an essentially a water cycle, you know, a micro water cycle within them. Um, but it's very difficult. And then you need to use pump systems, and then the pump systems are creating noise as well. And, you know, so you're essentially trying to recreate the universe in a raindrop. Um, one of the questions that I had at that time was, how can you write music for water? How can you notate this in a score? And a phrase that um, I heard at that time and, and that's been constantly uh, a companion to me is this idea of trying to create something which is always and never the same. Always and never the same. And this is something that I see in lots of different facets of the world and the universe that we live in. You see it in the way that water patterns, cloud patterns form, but you also see it in fire. You see it in flame. You see it in creatures, in stars, uh, in more or less everything, actually. There is this kind of always but never the sameness. And actually, as an improviser, this is really what you want, right? You know, no one wants to play a piece and it be exactly the same. You know, you want something that has this kind of aliveness essentially that it's 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 this thing you know it's a thing it's the same but it's not quite the same and there's this kind of um i would say vivacity to it um so at that time i'd only ever written notated music um where everything is very fixed and so i was really struggling like how do you how do you write this down you can transcribe one instance of that particular drip pattern but that's just once the toilet was never the same. Every time you did it, it was another badass <laughs> drum pattern. Um, so, you know, I was really struggling, struggling with this. And there was a kind of a, a breakthrough moment um, where I was in Kiev and I, it was New Year's Eve 2010. So I was going into 1111. Lesser had a, a New Year's gig. Uh, so I was alone in a flat in Kiev. Uh, and I watched Nostalgia, which is, for me, was the last of Tarkovsky's seven films that I hadn't seen. And I'm sure you all know Tarkovsky. You might not know the book. Uh, this is Tarkovsky's book, Sculpting in Time. Uh, Andrei Tarkovsky, the great Russian director, had a theory that every art form has its own medium. Music has sound, literature has text, painting has light, and so on. Um, but he said that the medium which is unique to time, sorry, <laughs> the medium which is unique to film is time. And so he talks about sculpting uh, in time. And I watched this film, and the film finished at maybe 11 p.m. And there's an amazing scene in that film where the two oil drops kind of become one, and then on the, on the blackboard it says one plus one equals one. And I suddenly just realized how to write for water. And so I started writing the score at you know, 11 p.m. At midnight, the fireworks went off outside the window and I was still writing. And, and I finished the score at like 5 a.m., which is when Leslie came back from the gig. Uh, and this was Water Project 1 um, and Water Project 2. Um, essentially, this is a graphic score. Um, the first part is a single sound which begins in silence and increases until it can no longer hold and then it, it falls. The second part are many sounds which eventually return to silence and the score instruction stipulates that you must use water in the performance. So this was the first instance of a score which would have something within it which would be the same, but it would never be quite the same. You know, and we performed this in, in numerous different ways. So I'll just show a little bit of the water project in action. <laughs> 
the structures now are called wing vortex and you see a development of uh, the shaping of forms. You disturb and the water behaves as, as a whole. It tries to integrate all influences which are working. And it's a vertical process going down and up and widening and narrowing. So working with um, Mamoru Fujeda, who just heard a little bit of there, was also a kind of a major breakthrough. Fujeda studied with Feldman uh, in the 60s in, in San Diego and then spent his entire career uh, in a project working on music called The Patterns of Plants, um, where he, he worked with a botanist called Yuji Dogane um, to develop essentially a kind of what they called a plantron, which was a a sensor you put on the stem of a plant that measures the electrostatic impulses and then converted that into sound. And I love that idea that he was directly giving voice uh, to, the, to the plants and, and that was a big influence on me. Um, what you just heard at the end, there was a, a field recording from Irlo Lina's house, the great Chano singer, uh, and he lives in a, a townland in West Cork called Tirna Spadoigia, or the, the land of the robins. Um, and the next thing that I became fascinated by in, in 2013 were starling murmurations. This is one uh, on the River Shannon. And there were quite a lot of these videos doing the rounds uh, at that time. And I just remember seeing them and there was something in the way that they looked that reminded me of this water. It was this always and never the sameness. That, that you look at the flock and, and you see one singularity, um, but you also see this constant difference. And as Jonathan was saying there, essentially the, the flock is an excellent example of an emergent system. Um, there was an incredible photograph that just won the Irish Times uh, photograph of the year, which I should have a copy of really, but don't. But it, it shows an image of a single flock that looks like one bird. I'm sure you've probably seen these kinds of images, and which is an, a, a, the quintessential um, example of this macro and micro singularity. Um, so I started thinking, OK, can I in some way create music which gives voice to the, this sense of, of the flock? Um, and inspired by Fujeda, I thought, well, maybe I can work with a scientist and I'll, I'll get some data for a bird flock and I'll translate that into sound. And naively, I thought that would be a very easy thing to do. Um, and I had a friend um, who was doing a, a PhD in mathematical biology, Luke Coburn. And so I said, Luke, I want to write a piece for saxophone orchestra. Can you give me data for a flock of 12 birds and how they fly around? Um, and he was like, no. <laughs> uh, but he said, I know someone who can, uh, and his name is Ian. So I said, OK, and I wrote to Ian. I said, hey, Ian, I'm a composer and I'd like to write some music about birds. And can you send me some data on uh, a flock of 12 birds, please? Um, and he replied back about four minutes later to say, I'm currently in the Serengeti Plains. And in order to do that, I'll have to cross the desert to get my Linux computer before I fly to Tel Aviv at five o'clock in the morning. Um, and then at what was about four minutes to 5 a.m., I got a second email 
with all of the data sets. And I wrote back and I was like, thanks. <laughs> Uh, what I didn't realize was that Ian was Ian Cousin, who is the world's leading mathematical biologist. And at that time, he was running the Cousin Lab in Princeton, which was a lab of 250 postdocs. Um, he's now the director of the Max Planck Institute in Germany. And this was a huge lesson for me because I realized that if you want the answer to something, you ask the person in the world who is the leading expert in that field. And they will reply to your email straight away and tell you exactly what you need to know. <laughs> Simple, <laughs> you know? And we have the internet, so it's like, it's really easy. Um, so Ian sent me uh, two data sets, actually he sent me four data sets, I used two of them. Um, this is a visualization of the data. Uh, in the bottom left corner, you can see flock one. Uh, in the top right, you can see flock three, which are the two data sets I used. The difference here is that in the left hand side in flock one, the flock is moving horizontally in space, uh, in the top right, they are swarming uh, around a fixed point of orientation. So it's two different types uh, of flocking behavior. And I used that data, which was basically just X, Y, Z uh, parameters for each bird. And I mapped that with using pitch, rhythm, and dynamic for the three parameters. And that created um, a, two etudes, I would call them, for saxophone orchestra. You can see that a, a bit of that in, in the bottom right. Um, but almost as soon as I finished writing those two pieces, I realized that it was completely pointless um, because it was the same problem as this kind of uh, fixed point entity that somebody reading this music, you know, the, the sopranino player on the top line can just sit there and read those notes and play them in time, but doesn't actually need to learn and understand anything about bird flocking. So what's the point? You know, and somebody sitting in the audience could listen to that piece and be like, lovely, <laughs> very different, <laughs> yeah? um, but not actually learn anything about how birds flock, really. Um, so this was a pretty big realization. And essentially, you know, I was able now to kind of condense it into this idea that music is a kind of a triplicity. And we interface with music in three roles. We interface as a listener, as a performer, and as a composer. Uh, this is what I would call a triplicate interface. Um, and what I realized, essentially, is that it's only when these three roles are combined that we actually have embodied knowledge, which is the subject of this talk. Luckily, <laughs> it's not always. Um, so. What that means really is that because the composer is the only one that actually engages with the rules, the knowledge is in the composition. So if you have this kind of separation of the composer, the performer, and the listen, the knowledge is centralized. And what we really want is a decentralized system occurring within the unity of an individual, right? <laughs> That's what we want, isn't it? I think that's, that's definitely what we want. Um, so what that means in, for our purposes is that in order to be the listener and the performer and the composer at the same time, you have to be an improviser. Okay, thank you, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because as, you know, if you are a performer, you would hope you're also a listener, right? Not always, but most of the time, you know, musicians are listening to everyone else as well as themselves while, while they're playing. Um, and of course, we are spontaneous composers. Um, so in this system, you have an, an embodied knowledge. And what I wanted then was to hand over this kind of understanding to the performers. Um, so I realized as soon as I finished flocking two, that I needed to create a flocking three, which would be the, the kind of the score, which would combine all of these uh, into an entity. So, in order to do that, I had to go deeper into where the data was coming from, which is actually a really Im important point. Who trains the data set you know, is, is the big question. So uh, the way that bird flocking is modeled um, is based on something called the Boyd's algorithm, which was developed in 1985 by a guy called Craig Reynolds. 
Um, and you've seen this Boyd's algorithm in action. If you've ever seen any CGI movie or game where there's birds flocking, it uses this technology. You've also seen it if you've ever seen drones in a swarm, they use this algorithm. I'm going to show you the very first uh, instance of this. This is uh, the Boyd's demo. That was the uh, the blockage in the path of our own banality there. Uh, this is what it looks like now. Uh, it's much smoother. The graphics have been in, uh, enhanced, but the principle is still exactly the same. So essentially what I needed for Flocking 3 was to find those rules and codify them and actually embed them into the score and hand them over to the performer. Uh, so in order to understand that, I need to show you a little bit of how the algorithm actually works in practice. So this is the score for Flocking 3, but handily, it's also how the algorithm actually functions. If I walk over there, will they still see me? of these three zones, the birds create these emergent flock systems. So this is what the Boyd's algorithm uses. It's a little more complex than that because actually what birds do is to change the rules of exactly how big these zones of influences are, just as we do actually when you're getting on a train and it's really crowded your repulsion zone shrinks because you have to, because you need to stand like that. You don't just stand there going like this. <laughs> you know? And actually by changing those zone sizes, that enables the, the flocks to have different types. So this is what creates the swarm type as opposed to the, to the movement type. Um, so flocking three basically parameterizes those zones. Uh, in the outer zone, the zone of attraction, the rule for the improvisers is to move towards the note that you hear around you. Uh, and that's the only rule. So this is written for saxophone orchestra. So you have a spatially arranged saxo saxophone ensemble and you get this kind of shifting harmonic texture, which is always and never the same because the notes are always changing. It requires the saxophonist to listen because they need to hear which note. They obviously have to play, but they also choose what they're going to play and how. And you know, there's obviously space for nuance there and for kind of musical, musical, 
uh, frameworks and, and phraseologies to enter into it. There, at some point, there is a kind of an emergent trigger where any one of the saxophonists stays on one note. When the others hear that that's happening, they can then all stay on one note, and that is then the trigger to move to the second space, which is the zone of alignment. The rule there is that it's a rhythmic-based sound, which starts in different tempi and gradually moves together until everyone's locked into a groove. When everyone's locked in, that's the trigger to go to the repulsion, which is the dynamic zone. And then the rule is to move away from the dynamic. So when everyone is playing really quiet, suddenly play very loud. And then you get this kind of chaotic texture. After that, there's a breath sound, and that is the cycle to go back into the top. Nothing else is set within the piece. So you could stay two hours on each zone, or you could spend two seconds on each zone. You could go around 50 times, you could go around once. Um, it also threw in another element, which was a predator, which was a f one saxophonist who just moved around playing multiphonics. And when they kind of came into the space, that created this kind of other thing that was happening out of interest. You could also have subgroups, obviously, within the thing. So basically, the point was that it was a structure which enabled um, this music to come about, which was always and never the same. So this was commissioned by the European Saxophone Orchestra, which was 12 saxophonists from 12 European countries, and then they toured it around Europe. Um, and they always started every concert with this piece because the director, Guillaume Monti, said that it really helped them to listen and come together as an ensemble. So I'll give you a little a taste of that. De, des mouvements de groupe, uh, Without really knowing anything about how it worked or what was the story, I was just like, wouldn't it be great if you could just put that on the score and find a way of getting people to play that? to accelerate the pace now and cut out the amount of amusing anecdotes because we're running really low. This is usually a nine hour talk, by the way, so <laughs> I'm trying to go. Um, so it took three iterations to get from flocking one to flocking three to actually achieve a score which had this improvisation and the triplicate interface embedded within it. The next uh, kind of series of pieces was uh, based on forest canopy ecology. Uh, and this is a work that was originally composed for orchestra called Woodland Heights. Uh, this is where I grew up in Chorley Wood. You may well know it. Usually when I'm giving this talk, no one does, but actually here you actually probably do because on the Met line, right? Um, so it's a, it was a house uh, that was in King Charles's Wood, which was once a royal hunting wood. So amazing old growth forests. And we were very fortunate as children to have foxes and badgers and deers in the back garden, but most importantly, trees that we grew up with. And when I was a child, the trees that I played with every day were my best friends. Literally, they would still be uh, if the house hadn't been destroyed and the forest cut down. Um, when that happened, it kind of instigated uh, something of a crisis situation um, where I was like, well, if I'm going to lose the house and the forest forever, I'm going to use this as a chance to learn more about forests in general. Um, so I did basically what I had learned from my conversation with Ian. And I said, okay, I need to speak to the world's leading expert. <laughs> and it's like, the world's leading expert on forests, enter. Um, and it came up with Thomas Lovejoy, who was the scientist who coined the term biodiversity. Okay, dear Thomas, uh, composer, forests, music, enter. Uh, and he wrote back and said, well, who you need to speak to is Margaret Lohman, or Canopy Meg, as she's known in the trade. Um, Canopy Meg was CC'd on that email, and about 20 minutes later, we were having a Zoom. Well, it wasn't Zoom, it was a Skype call <laughs> at that time. Um, and Meg Lohman is an incredible person, and I invite you to, to go and check out her work. Um, at, at that time, she was the director of the Institute for Biodiversity, Science and Sustainability in California, in San Francisco. Um, and Meg was one of the scientists who created forest canopy ecology in the 1970s. 
Um, this came about because prior to her and her team's work in the rainforests, it was very difficult to map large uh, areas of the rainforest. But the way that people, when I say people, I mean Western, mostly white people were doing it, was going there with cranes or balloons, and it's incredibly expensive and slightly destructive to try and map these areas. Um, obviously, people who've lived there for thousands of years just already knew them really well. Um, but what they did with Meg and her team was to bring in uh, SRTs, or single rope techniques, which is basically where you have a harpoon with an arrow and a rope on it, and you go, thunk, and you shoot an arrow up 70 meters in the canopy, and then you climb up a single rope. Um, and it's mountain climbing techniques. What this meant was that it enabled scientists in a completely cheap and inexpensive and very fast way to suddenly survey huge areas of the rainforest that they'd never been able to do before. And from their research in the 70s, they had to multiply the total number of estimated species in the world by 300%. Because they realized that 95% of all biodiversity in the rainforest is in the canopy layer because it's very dark under the canopy layer. And you've got frogs 70 meters up in the ground living in pools in leaves who haven't touched the ground for maybe 5 million years, and maybe 50 million years. You know? So they, there's this whole ecosystem. Actually, Meg calls it the, the sixth continent is, is the rainforest canopy. Um, I can't keep talking about that. <laughs> I'm going to have to skip on. We can talk about it over, you know. Anyway, so Meg uh, gave me a, a lot of information and access to a lot of scientists um, who were active in this field. Um, I read a lot of amazing books, all of which I can give you all the slides if you want to write some of these down, but I, I would highly recommend uh, all of these, uh, particularly all of them, but particularly... <laughs> Uh, the Ecological Thought by Timothy Morton uh, and The Forest People by Colin Turnbull. Also The White Goddess by Robert Graves. What, one thing that I'll always do when I'm kind of studying a scientific topic is to have a kind of a counterpoint text, um, which is not at all scientific. And uh, The White Goddess is an incredible book, which was Ted Hughes's uh, big influence on the Crow poems. Um, and which talks about this movement from a matriarchal to a patriarchal society by studying the Oum script, the Irish Oum script. Um, so I was lucky enough at that time to get a residency in the Centre Cultural Irlandais uh, at Paris, um, where I wrote a piece called Woodland Heights, which is the name of the house, for a uh, string orchestra. And essentially the piece was a model of how that forest would have grown over 720 years. Um, mapping the species of the forest to strings of the orchestra and then the growth over time uh, from uh, the kind of natural harmonics of each string. So, for instance, an early colonizer spe species like the laurel lives for 70 years. So in the piece, the gesture lives for 70 beats. Over 70 beats, it goes up to the 13th partial. It reseeds other strings, et cetera, et cetera. Over time, the larger trees will take over. That's what happens. Uh, in a forest over after two, three, four hundred years, the oaks or the beach, beaches will take over. They dominate the canopy. And then you have an oak wood or a beech wood for maybe a couple of thousand years until you get some kind of a disaster event, like a windfall, a fire or something. The big trees will fall. The other trees, the young uh, colonizers, have their seeds in the ground. They've been there for hundreds of years. They see a, a canopy gap or a, a patch of light. They grow up and you get this cycle. And over time, the biodiversity increases, which was really the key thing that I wanted to get across, that if you leave a forest alone for thousands and thousands of years, although it will constantly cycle in these generation, regeneration, disaster growth events, over time, the total number of species will increase. But this is over ecological time, not human time. So we're talking thousands of years. If you leave it for thousands of years, you'll see more and more species. And that's why the oldest forests in the world are also the most biodiverse. Um, around two months in, I realized that I'd really fucked it up and I'd left out a viola. Um, I was supposed to write for four. It's always a viola, right? <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
And so I was like, okay, um, what am I supposed to do? I've got like th three violas. I'm supposed to have four. Do I just go back to the beginning and, and write like a you know a bullshit fourth viola part? And I was like, no, there must be a creative reason that this has happened. So I said, okay, I'm trying to increase the the biodiversity. So I'll introduce a new species into the forest in in the third uh, kind of section. The new the new species was the Malus sylvatica, the wild apple. Um, and so at that point, the viola solo comes in, they play a cadenza, it increases the harmonic palette of the piece, uh, they play the piece and they play the bit, then the kind of third section kind of amplifies, and then, and I'd already at this point written in various kind of tree stuff into the score, like I wanted the orchestra to rustle leaves, I wanted them to shake branches, I wanted them to have to go into the forest before the gig, because that was part of the kind of immersive experience. Um, so. I'd written all of the score instructions in Italian um, because I wanted the orchestra manager who was going to get the score to at least read the whole thing before they threw it in the bin. But uh, after the viola solo finished their cadenza, I wrote and knew that I had to write, even though I knew that they wouldn't play the piece if I did this, but I wrote Si piante un albero, which means plant a tree. And it was also a moment where I realized that, you know, we're composers, right? Compose, composing means you can make stuff up, which also means you can make stuff happen, which means that you can tell people to do anything and they have to do it because <laughs> it's in the score, right? That's classical music, <laughs> right? But that's immense power, right? It is. For us as composers in 2021, we can write the future by creating a present that we want to imagine. So I was like, well, we need more trees, so plant a fucking tree. <laughs> Uh, obviously, the orchestra didn't play it because they were like, I mean, how are we going to program this? Like with the four seasons? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but it didn't really matter because for me, what was important is that, you know, music is such an ephemerality. You know, when, when music is finished, it's gone. But a tree is real. And if you plant a tree in the ground, it's going to stay there, hopefully, especially if it's been such a pain in the ass to plant this tree that you needed a whole orchestra to do it, it's got a slightly better chance of survival, you know, having them been planted. Uh, so it wasn't played by the orchestra that it was written for, but it did go on to represent Ireland at the International Society for Contemporary Music Festival in South Korea. Uh, and one of the stipulations in the score was that the tree to be planted had to be a native tree. So it was a Camellia japonica. I love that you can hear the trowel there. <laughs> so by coincidence, and you will find the more you go into this kind of thing, that the more you get on, the more coincidences tend to happen. Uh, the next day was National Tree Planting Day uh, in South Korea. It was Arbor Day, and so the tree was planted in front of the Lee sang uh, concert hall. But again, almost as soon as I'd seen it actually being played, in fact, before it was even played, on, on the day that I finished it and was leaving Paris, I realized that this was still the equivalent of flocking one, flocking two, because the piece is fully composed. Um, so it's one instance of how a forest would grow, but it doesn't have the never the sameness. It has the always and the sameness. And so I realized that I needed to write a second iteration of the piece. Um, and that piece is called Little Woodland Heights, as opposed to Big Woodland Heights. Um, and Little Woodland Heights is a work for children's ensemble, which is effectively a 10 week program that teaches children about forests through music uh, and which 
engenders them going to a forest on week three and choosing their own tree and mapping the tree to music. And then when the piece is performed, they plant a tree also. I'm going to fly through this. Um, the, this, was the, this is the Institute for Biodiversity Science and Sustainability uh, in San Francisco, where Meg was the director. So I went there and uh, actually gave the first iteration of this talk. Um, and wrote the piece. This is the tree architecture theory developed by Francis Halle, who's kind of like the French David Attenborough. Um, and th this is phylotaxic patterns by Roger Jean. So effectively, the kids go in, they choose a tree, they're like, that's my tree. Then they map the branch structure to a rhythmic clave. If they choose a palm tree, they get oof, 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 oof. <laughs> If they choose a, a type two, which is a pine tree or, or, or any kind of uh, fir tree, they get this dufka, 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 dufka. Uh, And if they choose a type that splits, type three, the beat splits. So you get dufka, ka, da, ga, da, ga, which as well as teaching the children to look at trees and see the architectural types, also teaches them to read rhythmic notation. If you can understand that the tree splits, you can understand that the beat splits. Uh, so then they get a clave, then they look at the phylotaxic pattern, all trees in the world are one of four phylotaxic types, the spiral, alternate, world, and opposite. They, they decide or they work out which one it is. They map that onto the stave. That gives them a low, high, low, high <laughs> pattern. And then they, that gives them their own melody. This also, of course, teaches them to read stave notation. Um, they also make a field recording at each tree. And then they amplify the sounds that they hear uh, at it. The one of the core texts for this was How Forests Think by Eduardo Con, which looks at the Runa people in Ecuador and the way that they live with the forest through dream, which I could talk about for another hour, but I won't. Um, and the main kind of um, sonic, actually, no, this, this is one of the recordings. So it uses uh, a dream text that the children make. The morning that they go to the forest, they write down five words from a dream they had the night before. And then all of those words are put together into a single dream text. And if the tree has a cranny in it, which teaches the Irish word for tree, it, they whisper their dream text so it's embedded in the audio, which sounds like this. cool thing about this is that you then do a second dream text the morning that they have spent the day in the forest, the morning after they've spent the previous day in the forest, and you get to see how the experience of spending a day in the forest filters through the children's unconscious, and the dreams that they have the next day are all trees, forests, angels, spirits, you know, fairies, and so on. The, the kind of musical map for this were the Mabuti pygmies uh, from the Congo. Uh, yeah. This is Colin Turnbull's book. <laughs> Amazing recordings. One of these went on the Voyager Golden Disc uh, into space to represent the Earth's music. They learned the Latin names. It's essentially a book. This is kind of the score. Here's a bit of it. <laughs> So one of the great things about working with children is that they're natural improvisers. Children naturally play.
So even though you've written, you know, or they have written actually, because they're the composers, but they've written, you know, a clave and, and a melody and thing, what you actually get is this incredibly complex rhythmic notation that there's no way you could write because children aren't actually going to do that. Some of them will, kind of, <laughs> but actually you get this like super dense, incredibly complex texture, which has this always and never the sameness about it. So children just naturally do this. So this piece has been done a bunch of times now, various different 10 week programs. Uh, I'm going to just skip actually basically the next section, but, but essentially I'll, I'll sum it up. Um, the, the next kind of phase in this was all about astro and quantum physics uh, and in creating an installation that teaches children about space, uh, which included a residency in the European Space Agency, um, but we don't have time. So you get the idea, basically they learn about space through music. <laughs> The key to this was uh, a kind of kinetic array uh, which maps the movements of the children so that they create sound directly with their bodies without having to interface with an instrument, kind of similar to what you just saw uh, with Jonathan. It also looks at some quantum stuff, um, transposing the sonic data uh, or transposing light data from the spectral information about stars and what they're composed of uh, into sound. This is the sound of hydrogen and the sound of oxygen. And so put together you get the sound of water, which brings us nicely back to our starting point. <laughs> if I just skip like all of these. Yeah, so to sum up, um, these, these three elements, this triplicate interface of listener, performer and composer needs this um, let's call it a, a kind of um, a collectivity of perception, action and cognition. These are the three aspects that we're actually using when we embody knowledge. And so I guess what I'm really arguing here ultimately uh, through these works, but also through, through many other aspects is that as musicians and composers and improvisers, we really need to take our shit much more seriously because it's not just that we're creating something which is of uh, you know, entertainment value, but actually there are things in the world that you can only understand through music. And this is something that humankinds and most animals have known forever, but we risk losing that if we don't take ourselves seriously and, and fight for that, actually. You know, we, we exist, this kind of thing is a niche culture. You know, we're like locked in a little room with like 10 people on a live stream, you know, whereas people have got 200 people on a live stream. Let's hear it for 200 people on a live stream. <laughs> really? Yeah. Awesome. Hey, guys. Uh, <laughs> well, that's great, but it's still not 50,000 people in, in, in a stadium, you know, uh, and it's not on, on mainstream television. And actually, this is something which is innate to children, to people in their nascent stages, we are natural improvisers. And actually, what's really central here is that there are ways of understanding the world that we cannot know through words alone or through data and numbers alone, but that we can only know through music and we can only know through music as improvisers. And so it's important that not only that we kind of satisfy our own urges, but that we also hand over this kind of understanding to the next generation and, and that we instill and pass on this knowledge and this fascination and curiosity with the world through the way that we perform music. Ding, 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 the end. <laughs> Thank you.